thank you, everyone. Today, uh, we are talking about a completely underserviced area, I would say data, which is actually fundamental to everything that we do. Everyone talks about integrated marketing a ton and you know, digital marketing and all this exciting segmentation and micro-targeting, et cetera, but it's all for naught unless your data is in a good place. And unfortunately, I don't think data infrastructure or actually looking at your data gets nearly the attention that it deserves. So we're here to talk about data. Uh, specifically, what we're going to start off with is kind of reviewing um, just a bit of background of who we are. We're actually Candela. We just rebranded actually come October 1st, so hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's happening. We used to be Chris uh, Cutter Marketing. Used, if uh, but anyway. Um, and what we actually focus, we're a full service uh, marketing, uh, fundraising, and management consulting firm. Uh, one of the big areas that we do is we kind of are I'd say typical problem solvers. So we deal a lot with infrastructure and kind of data issues and how databases are talking to each other and data. We obviously are familiar with engaging networks, but that's kind of our main area is just looking kind of infrastructure. So when we go in to do audits, when we work with a number of clients, we often kind of have these 10 best practices that kind of generally guide just what we're doing about how an organization should be using data, what the priorities are, et cetera. We're currently undergoing a big process with a client right now. So we're going to talk a little bit about a case study to actually, so you can start thinking about some of these rules and what sort of things you should be looking at when you're looking at your data. And then we're going to finish off. Um, Farrell will be leading us through um, looking at engaging networks, some specific tips and tricks for using engaging networks. Just so we can contextualize that. Oh, that's really loud. Um, so we can contextualize the data uh, for you. I feel like I need to turn that down. OK. Yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> um, so this is just, as I was saying, uh, these are typically the top 10 things that we're looking for constantly when we're about to start with data. And some of these might seem rather straightforward, but one of the first thing, and this is, this is comical in a sense, <laughs> that a lot of you would think, ensure all the similar data is housed in one location. Unfortunately, it usually isn't. So what will happen is there'll be rogue spreadsheets. We were actually working for a very, very large organization recently. Um, who you would think would be on the cutting edge in certain areas, and they had actually a Rolodex that kept all their big important donors, and that was the only place it was stored. And we're talking million of dollar types of donors that were on this Rolodex. So think about it that way. You're, you're talking about multiple different locations. It is still Rolodexes kicking around. We've got phones, we've got Excel spreadsheets, we've got all sorts of people that aren't necessarily comfortable in using a main CRM, not necessarily because of their fault, but they know Excel, so all of a sudden they've created their own volunteer sheet. And you can start thinking about all the potential problems that I could be creating. So first rule is start ensuring as a bare minimum that all your similar data is housed in the same place. And I just want to jump into also thinking about what is data. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, um, we've, we've come across clients that, for instance, you know, track their, um, their monthly gifts coming in, or maybe not their monthly gifts, but their, their philanthropic grants coming in through um, a, an Outlook um, calendar. And so that's actually a data source, right? But I don't think that they were necessarily thinking about that as, as a data source as well. So sometimes it's not even, you kind of have to kind of go, oh, okay, that actually is a data source that we can bring into a central database. Or even like shared. Another typical one is we're finding shared uh, files where it's almost like a standalone database has almost been created where everyone kind of has, oh, well, we have our shared, you know, our C drive or whatever, our E drive, and we've each of our major donors, they have a file folder. But then you're like, but you also have Razor's Edge and you also have engaging networks. And so all of a sudden these things just start spiraling. Another thing, and this again is a, another big surprise, is assigning clear definitions for all fields in the database. We often come across, um, you look at something, you go in, you look at a database, and you, you pause and you go like, wow, that raised $5 million in 1992, and it's called 496829E, and nobody has any idea what it was. So it's very important to have kind of really clear definitions. And even if it's just, um, and as much as you can, most databases are pretty robust, and we say databases, that's engaging networks as a database. Um, all of these different things, as much as you can, a lot of the databases are now functional enough that you can just use you know, common things like it's direct mail or it's an email. Like just use very standard uh, definitions. 
Another thing that we also find is, first of all, it's getting them all into the same database. But then another problem that we come across regularly is actually within the database, getting all the same type of data in the same field. So a pretty typical thing, and unfortunately there's rapid turnover, particularly in fundraising, but also in marketing, there's usually very rapid turnover. So what that leads is that someone will come in and be like, oh, we need to ask everyone what their nutritional interests are for that upcoming event. So suddenly they send out an email and they say, oh, wouldn't that be great to get in the database and then we never need to do it again. And so then they bullet in, they bring in all this info, and then someone did it two years ago, and then as well. And then before you know it, you've got eight different fields that all say something about nutrition, but they're all kind of tracking it a bit differently. So one says likes meat, one says meat, one says different things. So it has all these different things going on um, and not a consistency. So the key is to make sure that you have all the same type of fields in the same field, same types of data. Another thing uh, that is a pretty typical is the a bit where you can is make it sure that it's fixed. So that would be try and avoid things like free form tax fields. So that would be, um, you know, you can think of examples. It might be standard things like street addresses, like uh, street is always going to be the same. You know, avenue is always going to be the same. Think of things of where you can standardize it so you can minimize problems with uh, user error. Another thing that is a real typical and makes a huge difference, and you can do this across the board, whether it's in your engaging networks, when you're sending out emails, even how you set up like Google, grant accounts, you name it, kind of just come across, establish a standard naming and coding. And what that means is so that even if someone doesn't know what something is, if you have standards, they're always going to be like, I, need, I know that the year always comes first. So it means that a casual observer can see something and be like, OK, it says 2017. So that is definitely a following our coding standards. I know that's the year. So the idea is kind of building that rubric so that you have a standard coding across the board. Um, Another thing that we, we like to recommend, this is kind of one of those, what do you do if you're moving, moving forward? So let's say you've gone for an elaborate cleanup, you've collapsed multiple different databases, you've entered all the information from these shared folders, but now you need to make sure and say like, okay, how do we keep it clean? So one of the things we recommend is establishing a kind of a bit of a protocol. And you can see what can happen is if you have a series of questions where you're like asking, you know, do I need to attach this information to more than one donor record, for example? And when you ask these sort of questions, and whenever you're setting these up, you'll see that that will also determine the best place for it. Because if you have an either or, an example may be, okay, a donor is a corporation, or it could be a foundation. It's not going to be necessarily both. So put it somewhere where it can only be attached once. You can see that in that situation, if you put it in an area of the database where you're able to attach corporation and foundation and individual, just by user error, it can be attached like 10 times. And before you know it, you have a reporting and reconciliation nightmare. Um, number seven, this is from a perspective of just a security. Excel spreadsheets, you name it, privacy. Um, you, Europe just passed really strict regulations. Canada has strict regulations. It's up and coming across the world. You've, even just from a privacy perspective, regardless of just your ease of reporting and keeping good donor stewardship, et cetera, it's good to start eliminating external Excel spreadsheets. It's so easy to get something printed off, to have something left at a printer, et cetera. So as much as possible, start eliminating these uh, external sources of information. And think about it, um, it's gonna become more of a factor in the US, but if you think about a lot of the pushes with the privacy legislation, anti-spam, all those kind of legislation that are kicking in, that if you have all these miscellaneous sources, how are you gonna possibly be able to say, uh, uh, you know, I've opted out of that? And then you're thinking, oh, nobody's gonna remember. Well. And we need to make sure that we've opted them out of that volunteer spreadsheet over there too. Oh, and we need to make sure that that database also has them removed. So how can you possibly manage them if you have all these multiple sources? Uh, <clears throat> number eight is from a transparency and accountability point of view. The flip side of it is don't just necessarily put all the information that you need into a database. The question is, you know, is there stuff that you don't really need? Don't put it in. If you can't think of a use for it, some examples is we will come across weird comments, like they'll be like, they were really mean. Um, if things like that, uh, there's no point for them. So that's also the flip side. Don't store any information if there's no point for it. Um, 
Number nine is from a tracking perspective. An example I like to use here, and maybe you've experienced this yourself, is when you're, you're dealing with, a, say, a phone company. Um, and I am often phoning my phone company quite a lot because they've made a mistake. And they also, they, sometimes I've been wrong, but they have always have been able to respond to me. So they'll say, oh, but that's because in, in January 2017, you requested that you wanted to go on the 50 million the 50 minute plan or whatever it is. And so they've reminded me of a discussion that I've had before. So you can see how you can immediately, and the, the good customer service people are tracking your history. And if you're thinking from a donor perspective, they're gonna forget. They're gonna forget that they phoned you up in January and said, I'm gonna change my address. And then they'll get it and they'll get all outraged and they'll phone you up. And if you haven't got good centralized information and you also haven't been tracking crucial changes, you're not going to be able to de-escalate and explain to a donor what's been happening. And then finally, number 10. Um, this is a big one. Uh, a, couple, a couple of problems that we often see. First of all, if an organization does have a database manager, which unfortunately is quite rare, there's not that many database managers for out um, organizations. But when they do, it's kind of usually maybe it's buried in IT or finance. Maybe they're not that senior. And that's one of the big problems is that they're often overruled. So it's key for an organization to have kind of empowered database managers. So that, that it means that if someone just feels like, well, I want to put all my random um, Excel information in there, and then the database manager will be like, no, that's going to mess up reporting, and the finance team won't ever be able to reconcile again. You can't do that. But then they'll be like, that is being difficult. Up and over they go, and before you know it, they've been overruled, and then there's chaos that is ensuing. So it's very important from an organization that you kind of respect your database managers and they are empowered, that they're kind of seen as a bit more of the, you know, the respect that they're given. I'd also say that's the enforcement side, but another big issue that we often come across is training. So I don't know what onboarding has been like for, say, any of the organizations you've been at, but we often find as well one of the reasons why people are relying on things like Excel spreadsheets um, and other miscellaneous sources because there's been no training. So someone will come in, maybe they haven't been hired specifically to do data-related stuff, but you know they've been hired to do an event or they've been hired to do some digital marketing or you name it, and they haven't necessarily used the system before or they're not too familiar with the system, so they don't really have concepts um, in terms of data, et cetera, and it may not be necessary for them for their day-to-day but they still need to understand the key CRMs. So we find that a lot of investment in just training, getting people to understand and understand the services would, would eliminate a lot of those miscellaneous sources. Okay, so kind of those are the kind of guiding top 10 that we often be going in. Any other questions before I kind of jump into the next round? Okay. This is for the end too. <laughs> this is me having my data rent. Um, so what we actually do then is just to give you a bit of an example, we've got a case study here. This is one that we're undergoing right now. We, we've done a lot of these. We're not telling you who it is, and you'll see why, because it, they actually deal a lot with children. Um, so from a private perspective, we're not gonna be revealing the type of organization, but they're a camp for your children, a very large camp. Um, so, and so they help thousands and thousands of children every year. And so this just gives you a bit of an example of, of putting into practice. So what sort of things and what, what are some of the issues that we're dealing with that we come across? So in this case, they are switching over to engaging networks. What is great, this is a great opportunity. And, and so an organization like this has paused and said, we're about to make a technology shift. Wouldn't this be an amazing time for us to review our infrastructure to get a sense of where our, what data is, where our databases is, and to actually think about how we're gonna be using engaging networks. And immediately you might be thinking, well, it's just gonna be sending out emails. But then there's all these questions about, well, do you have volunteers? Do you have events? Do you have major donors? Do you have board members? Like how exactly are you bringing these sources together? How are they using? So from their perspective, it was very much about thinking about all their different areas. And from just telling you about the group, you can see that they've got things like campers and parents and volunteers and staff people, tons of different areas of um, data that's coming in and different um, individuals that they're tracking. There's a bit of a problem, I'd say, in the industry in terms of thinking about things in silos. Uh, often people are like, oh, well, that's the volunteer list. 
but there's huge overlap. No constituent thinks of your organization from a siloed perspective. They'll be on your email file, they'll be on your volunteer file, they'll be on your donor file, they'll be interacting with you regularly. So that's the key, one of that was the key area was to start thinking about the structure of their database, looking at the architecture. They also, a running problem that they've had, and lots of organizations do, is actually just reporting. So when you have all these multiple different systems, it's hard just to like do financial reconciliation, to actually understand what's going on. So that was another issue. And then fundamentally, because they've got all these different databases going on, it was really a priority to clean the data and start getting, start wiping out duplicates. So, um, from their perspective, we've under, we went under this, this huge discovery process, and what we started to do was just identify all the multiple different databases. So if you can start thinking about the type of organization that we're dealing with here, they have a database that handles their camp, that's thousands and thousands of people, they have a database that's handling their emails, they have a database that's handling their volunteers, they have a major gift database, they have like separate standalone volunteer databases. All their event databases. They have separate event databases, and then they also have tons of just those miscellaneous Excel spreadsheets. And they also have shared files where they're just like, oh, well, we just keep all the background on that event and this on the shared drive. So they have just tons of these duplicate databases all over the place. Say a volunteer or like a volunteer organization. How are you tagging these different constituents in Razor's Edge or the main CRM, but not leaving them in isolation? And then how is that information getting up into engaging networks. So it's all that kind of process of a big cleanup, getting a situation and getting your tagging and then making sure that you've built the instance correctly and engaging networks. Okay. All right. Um, another couple other things that we're dealing with is we're also looking at say different things such as like with relationships. Um, uh, one example might just be we might need to be setting up specific relationship records between the two. Uh, this is a new functionality that was included in engaging networks. But if you think about this organization where we're dealing with, say, the children and the patient and the parents, and then we're also dealing with volunteers, you also need to be looking at how are we going to be actually setting them up? How is that linking information going to be happening? And so this is just demonstrating there's a lot of different areas that can come up where you need to think through and think, okay, how are we doing this tagging? How are the two systems going to be syncing between? All right. And the goal is to end up with a perfectly clean database right at the end. After a dupe check and removal After process. a massive dupe check. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of breezed through that very quickly, but you can see that it's a very, and every organization is a, a very different. And it's really just going through that discovery process and identifying all your different databases but we don't really talk about even thinking through what your goals are. So if we need to, you know, if it's, it's delivery, volunteers are crucial, events are crucial, our board members are crucial. It's kind of just getting a bit of understanding of your work and then getting all your databases and your systems to align so you can do it. You've got a nice big clean database with a million uh, constituents in it. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, a million. 100,000 of them have email addresses. What do you do with the other 90,000? <laughs> How do you, if they've been hit in an email, how do you add them to the database automatically? Yes, so if you're dealing, are you dealing with a Razor's Edge, or are you dealing with? No, we're dealing with another fulfillment provider or whatever, but you know, we, we publish a magazine, we also take in donations, we have kind of similar databases, but we, most of our stuff is done through direct mail. Yes. So it's not done by email. Yes. So only the ones that have an email address are in engaged networks because you can't live in engaged networks unless you have an email address. Correct. Um, there's, some, there's some ways around it. There are a couple of things that you can do to have your constituents, but it, it it, yeah, and I'll let Chris um, answer in a larger, but yeah, it also just depends on how you are using your different pieces of software, but that absolutely is one way to use enge uh, engaging networks is only to have your individuals in there that do have um, email addresses, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the key, the key decision to be made is you need to identify one master CRM, so that's the first decision, which is often missing, so you need to say, 
typically razor's edge, but there's others, Salesforce, you name it. Um, you need to identify one as your central CRM, and that also becomes the source of truth, which is also key. And so you need to have all these other databases should be subservient to your essential source of truth, as it were. So in this case, it's not always the case, but often there's a combination of, say, a razor's edge and an online platform, such as engaging networks. So all the information is getting into your central CRM, so that would be your direct mail. And if people are providing direct mail email addresses, it's entering into your central CRM. So you've got all these processes coming into your central, and then it's figuring out, OK, what's the connection between engaging networks? So you want to make sure that you don't have five or six different almost standalone systems. They're all kind of subservient to your one main database. And that's the key. And that will be, and then once you've done that, then you know it's all coming in here, I and mean, then it makes the connection between engaging networks and, say, Race's Edge or Essential CRM really easily. And there are software. There is great connection software between Omatic has one, JMG Solutions have one. There's other connection softwares between engaging networks and, say, Race's Edge that then will just bring and do the updates. And then you've simplified it. It really comes down to getting that central CRM and being very strict about it that this is where it goes and all the information goes into it, but you don't have these six or seven different systems that all could have standalone. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you'd be running your queries out of your central um, CRM for your direct mail, for instance, and then pulling your data out of that, yeah. And, and, what, I, and what's good with a couple of these connecting systems, they're bi-directional, so it means that if you get updates, if you've got this running, then they will go back and forth and update one another. So that will also mean that if, if a new email address has gone into your main CRM, it's going to upload it and bring it into engaging networks. But if you had all these separate standalone systems, you're constantly going, I don't know, do we upload it into engaging networks? But that could be a dupe and blah, blah, blah. So if you've cleaned it up and narrowed it down, it simplifies everything else. But usually, usually you have to go through, and we, we, we went through this really quickly, usually you have to go through a bit of what we were just talking about, a bit of an audit and the discovery and a bit of a cleanup, and then start afresh. This is you now. Well, I was gonna give you the first couple of slides. <laughs> we're gonna get, so, so now that we've sort of talked about data, we thought it would be um, you know, a, a kind of a good idea to start sort of talking about um, practical applications for your nice clean data um, within engaging networks. And so how does segmentation actually work? What can you do with it? I'm sure there's probably tons of people in the room um, that are using a lot of these features of engaging networks. But um, really, uh, once you have your clean data um, and your streamlined data, you can really start um, putting and, and powering up these, um, these features that we're just going to go through fairly quickly. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the new features that came in in the June, um, uh, the June um, update. update. Thank you. Um, not this latest one on Friday. It's too fast, but we put some <laughs> stuff in the one in June, yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, this is just, it's kind of linked to what we were talking about earlier, which is you've got tons of customi customization ability in Gage Networks and functionality, um, which is wonderful. But on the flip side, that can also be dangerous that you have a level of functionality and customization. So that's one of the reasons why, and we emphasize in some of the discussions that we we're having about fields and so forth, is that it would be so easy to go into engaging networks and create 50 fields and be like, this field's going to track income, and this field's going to track hobbies, and this field's going to do this. And before you know it, you've got these 50 things, and it could be amazing for the first few maps. But then all of a sudden, you'll see that maybe that information is also being tracked in other things, or maybe in different Excel spreadsheets. Or maybe it's a report that you can't bring up in a certain way because it's a canned report that's built a certain way within engaging networks. So. Exactly. And so it, it's, it's important to never kind of treat these systems in isolation and think and have a bit of a conversation. And that's where kind of those, some of those cross-functional teams and kind of database teams are important. Thinking, OK, we need to track income, or we want to track <laughs> hobby. I and mean, then you're thinking about it more holistically, I and mean, then you're saying, oh, OK, we're going to create this field. It's going to be an engaging networks. It's going to be called hobby. But then that's also going to then line up to the same hobby field in Razor's Edge. So when we're bringing over the information, and then the secondary part of it is, and we're not going to call them different things. So even in the subset of this field, it's going to say reading. It's not going to say likes books. So you're going to have then consistency even with the terminology that you're using within the fields. 
So it's very much looking holistically and making sure that you're matching all between your different systems. Okay. And I think I said that. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, that I, I've learned with using tools um, like Engaging Networks um, and others like them is, um, and back when I was a fundraiser as well, um, we'd be, we would be using fields in ways, um, sort of as I was saying, that, that aren't totally correct. And then when I wanted to leverage a feature or I wanted to run a report or I wanted to do a certain thing, the way that the tool was built, um, I couldn't. Because the tools are, I mean, these are great tools. They're kind of given to us. Um, the, they're, they're not particularly customized in, in a lot of ways because we can't necessarily afford to build a full um, custom out tool, right? It cost a million dollars. So engaging networks does a lot of the heavy lifting for us, but um, because of that, there's systems and there's things that are put in place that make sense for the tool, and, and, and it's, it's important to, especially around data, um, use the tools that sort of meant to be used because then you'll find, you know, maybe when you decide to use some feature in two years that, that or they, you know, push through a great new feature, um, you have everything in place that allows you to use that feature as it's, as it's meant to be used. I don't know if I'm hopefully making sense there, but um, yeah. So yeah. Cool. File. So somebody has to click on it, has to interact, the system has to know who this person is. And again, remember to, and this is, can be a bit of a caveat, is it's just for your digital. So if you have a major gift, uh, major gift coming in, your major gifts aren't coming into the system, it's not going to necessarily recognize your major gifts unless you have a system. And it's just up, this is where you can find it in the email where it's popped up there. Um, I'm just going to pop through attributes because uh, we're kind of running out of time, but attributes is just a, a tag, not just, it's a tag you can um, ad adhere to uh, pretty much anything that allows you to aggregate your, your assets and your content so you can search on it. Um, again, this can be going through this, uh, this a portal. Email engagement scores, does anyone, everyone know about email engagement scores? These are also kind of cool, and I know that, um, I think in this talk previously, I poked my head in and saw that Eric and the team were talking about your inactive emails or, or looking at like who your least active um, supporters are, and you might want to try and re-engage them, you might want to try and look at purging some of them um, to keep your, your um, email scores up. There's lots of options. They actually use a, so Engaging Networks uses a score method. Um, and you can, again, create attributes. You can create, or not attributes, sorry, you can create profiles on these guys. Um, zero is a new one. It's all opted in records, uh, not in one to 10, and created in the past 12 months. Um, these are found in your email activity, uh, in your supporter um, uh, constituents. Um, and it can act as sort of shorthand to bundle groups of supporters together. Um, inactive supporters, most active supporters, targeting people that converted during a certain time. Uh, and what's also cool is you can run a report and just see a snapshot of your whole entire database, which will probably look like a lot of zeros, unless you're awesome. So what's new? We'll just buzz through this really quickly, um, because this is one thing that I really like, origin score. This has been really powerful for me um, for use in the past. Uh, because you can see how your users are coming into your database and then also how they perform um, throughout, their, uh, throughout their time with you. Um, so you can start to see what petitions are working really well or what activism um, is working really well, whatever way you want to track. So if you um, are saying, okay, these individuals came in through, you know, if you're running an evergreen campaign, for instance, to say like, I, I stand, say Planned Parenthood, I stand with Planned Parenthood, and you can see that those individuals are tracking very well, um, following uh, different advocacy actions, et cetera, et cetera, you'll be like, okay, I know that that is working for those people. Um, in addition, you can say, okay, did you send out a, a one-time gift? Um, a one-time gift solicitation, or a lot of people come through in a one-time gift donation form, and then the, a whole bunch of those people then converted into monthly donors. You're like, okay, there's something happening there, because um, these are creating particularly sticky supporters, and like, is it is it the messaging? Is it your UX? Is there something really great happening that where that way? And then in the flip side, so I think that Origin Source has just been introduced as pretty powerful, um, and I really I love I actually use this that, that data point all the time. Householding, um, this is what uh, Chris was alluding to. So this is really exciting. So you now can relate um, 
you can relate uh, constituents to each other. We're just exploring this and we're trying to see how um, we can, when we're sort of working with cleaning up data and relating the CRM, how we can start using this and bringing this all together. But it's really cool. Um, you can define relationships here. Our data analyst Tino and Chris are both my um, colleagues and you have like grandparent and all kinds of different tags you can put in. So it's really, it's really cool as well as you can get an immediate drop down and see a summary of all their activities activities, which is pretty, which is pretty cool. Mass deduplication, this is a licensed, um, licensed feature um, that's pretty exciting. Um, we haven't really looked too much at it, but I definitely uh, encourage you to look at that if that is an, an option. Um, you know, really in general, as Chris was saying, a strategy to manage your duplications is really important, a holistic plan. Um, to sort of tackle all of this, and this can be another really great tool in your toolbox. Um, data final uh, thoughts. When thinking about your data, looking holistically at your systems to ensure that the data is working for you. Um, round peg, round hole approach. Uh, I've done lots of implementations and I've had clients say, well, you know, what if we just jam this in this way? We can make all these great features happen like this. And I'm like, yes, but then in five years, you're not going to be able to use that report or in, you know, you're, you might be putting yourself at risk in the future. So really think about, learn the tools and figure out how the tools work best before you figure out how, or before you start thinking about customization. Definitely customization options are out there. They're great, but, um, and they're important, but um, really just think about how you can create the muscle of the tool first, because these tools are really powerful. Um, and there's a lot of ways that we've, 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 I've, I've come and talked to clients and they want to do something super custom because they've sort of changed the way they're using a lot of these fields that they actually could have done like organically or um, within the tool itself, uh, natively within the tool itself. But they've played around with their data so much they almost can't natively do it anymore. So that could have been a lot more cost effective. And that's it. I rushed through the final part because I'm hearing applause, applause and I'm getting the five minute and I know everyone wants to get to lunch. It's 1223. So we have a couple of minutes for any questions. Um, and we're also available if you want to come talk to us afterwards. We're sitting outside. I hope I learned something. No? Okay, great. So if there's typical typos and other things that would happen, um, as is one to do when you have thousands of people entering things into donation forms. Um, you can do quick corrections on the fly so it cleans up as it's bringing data in to uh, races X. In this case, we've got uh, American versus Canadian versus English spelling corrections um, and things along those lines. And another nice other features you can do is we've got like global features where you can be like, um, we've got an example of Toronto, New York is another example. If someone enters the Bronx but you want standardization so it says New York City, you can, for example, get um, that table put in and have that happen seamlessly. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, there's lots more, but... There's lots oh, more, there's but, but there you go. So <laughs> I wanted to just to say, it's often overlooked, but it's very important to have seamless data and there's lots of tools and this is one really good one that we regularly use that connects between Razor's Edge and Engaging Networks. And just to say again, it's, it's called the Super Importer Exporter and it's um, made by JMG Solutions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.